and we counted up kind of what our impact was. And our impact was reaching out 108,324 times and delivering that message. Now, what happened once it's delivered, I don't know. But 108,324 times that message was available for students, faculty, and staff to see. And when you talk about addressing uh, problems and issues in a college campus environment, um, that's what's necessary. Um, I can't go out and talk to 20 people and have my robbery prevention mes message heard so that it's going to really, really impact what happens with the crime of robbery. Putting it out there 108,000 times is the way that we need to, as a police department, start addressing a lot of problems and issues that we have. I will tell you, last year at this time, academic year, August 1st through today's date, last year we had seven incidences of robbery with 20 victims. This year we have had four incidents of robbery with five victims. So again, a dramatic reduction in victims of robbery last year versus this year. Next slide. Uh, we talked a little bit about larceny. Um, larceny, again, is a very, very big issue. Um, there's a lot of people that kind of say, if you don't nail something down here, uh, it's not going to be there when you get back. I say bolt it, not nail it. But um, larceny in the college environment is a very, very big issue. Last year, we saw a 4% reduction in larceny. So far, this academic year versus last academic year, we have a 35% reduction in larceny, which is significant. Larceny is one of those crimes which is very much like DUI. It's 100% preventable. If you don't leave your shirt here for me to take, I can't take it. So uh, we do a ton of prevention and education involving larceny because uh, we need to make everyone aware that if you leave items of value, MacBook Pros, sitting in the library because you had to go to the bathroom and you didn't lose your spot, uh, that's a bad idea. We do a lot of, uh, we, had, we had stickers made up last year so that when my officers do see items of value laying around, uh, they'll put a sticker on it. Sometimes they'll take that item and just wait for you to come back. Um, but again, it's a, a nonstop process of educating people um, and you guys can help as well if you do see some, someone who leaves something of value around, just tap them on the shoulder and let them know that it's uh, not a good idea. Next slide. Well, the, is there. I'll get you guys over there in a minute. the third thing that I want to talk to you guys about is employee conduct. And I say that not from a standpoint of misconduct or corruption, but there are certain expectations that I have of all of the police officers that you see in uniform, all the security staff that you see in uniform, all the people that drive the escort uh, vans and things like that. And my expectation is that they will bend over backwards to assist students, faculty, staff, and visitors. And if you encounter police officers or police department employees that don't do that, I ask that you please email me and make me aware of that particular situation. Um, this is something that I've been focusing on uh, since I got here to VCU, and I have heard a lot of feedback that uh, behavior is changing. And I want my police officers to bend over backwards to help you with whatever your issue is, whether it's crime related, whether you just have a question, or whether you just need some assistance. So I would appreciate that. Number nine and 12, if you come forward, we have a uh, little gift for you. And it is a uh, free one-year subscription to LoJack, which can be loaded on your laptop. Um, and if your laptop gets taken, if your laptop gets taken and it has LoJack on it, um, I wish I could tell you it was great police work. It's like cheating. We call LoJack up. They tell us where your computer is physically located, like it's at 1811 West Gray Street in the back bedroom. We go knock on the door and we go get it. So. Again, it's a, uh, a great product. Great. Yep. I also serve on both campuses on the threat assessment team. I wanted everyone to be aware of that. Uh, the health system has a threat <laughs> assessment team, as well as the, as well as the uh, academic campus has a threat assessment team. Uh, if you're not aware of what that does, uh, students, faculty, and staff that have concerns uh, regarding conduct of individuals, 
uh, those matters are brought to the attention of the threat assessment team, and we take all of those matters that are brought to the threat assessment team very, very ser seriously, and we look at it from a multidisciplinary approach, and uh, we work to mitigate and reduce the level of threat. Next slide. We're going to talk about social networking a little bit. These are the big, uh, the big five. Uh, anyone who belongs to LinkedIn, I know every morning you must get the same, hey, do you know uh, so-and-so? You can turn that off. But anyway, keep going. Um, but social networking has really had a little bit of impact on local police agencies. Um, obviously, it has become necessary for uh, police agencies to modify and put in place internal policies pertaining to the use of social media and social networking. Um, a lot of police agencies complain that their employees are on Facebook all day long. Um, a lot of police agencies' stuff has turned up on the Internet, crime scene photographs that are taken from our handheld devices immediately uploaded to Facebook. Um, the state has a pretty um, detailed social media policy that's in place. Uh, ours is much more restrictive than the state policy. Uh, because privacy uh, is kind of a very, very important issue when it comes to police work. Another thing that we are seeing um, with a lot of pre-employment uh, things that we are doing is um, searching a lot of the social networking sites for information on our applicants. If you're not familiar with the site called clout.com, people are now, through this website, um, it measures your level of social influence. People are actually putting their clout score on their resumes. Um, and clout measures your social influence based on the number of friends you have, the number of tweets you have, the networks that you're tied into. Um, very, very interesting concept. Uh, you may want to go measure yourself. Um, there's also a lot of search functions that are available on social media. And we at the police department use a lot of these search functions um, in searching for, sometimes we'll have information regarding uh, large parties that are getting ready to take place. Uh, we follow a lot of the protest uh, stuff that goes on in Richmond. We have a protest that is uh, planned Friday on the uh, academic campus behind the whole Wall Street uh, protest that you guys saw in New York last week where 700 people were arrested, large protest on the academic campus. But we do monitor the social networking sites for information uh, regarding that. We have in the, in the past um, got information on very, very large gatherings, parties that were taking place. Uh, we would kind of find Facebook and see that there were 400 some odd people uh, that were saying that they were going to attend a particular party at a residence. Um, we would then drive by the residence and say maybe 30 people could fit in that place. And, you know, in taking a proactive approach, we in turn will have a conversation with the people that live, the, live there and say, bad idea. Um, we've been very, very successful with doing that. One of the other things that we do in the police department is we, I actually attend and my officers attend all of the community meetings for all of the neighborhoods and civic associations that surround both of our campuses. Um, and you can imagine how a lot of those meetings go. There's a lot of off-campus student conduct that creates a lot of problems in the neighborhoods that surround uh, this campus as well as the academic campus. So we do work pretty proactively to mitigate a lot of those problems and issues. Some of the recent um, concerns associated, associated with a lot of the social media stuff is uh, obviously geotagging is the new concern. Um, and for those of you that have smartphones, uh, if you are taking pictures with your smartphones and you don't have your settings appropriately set, once you post that picture to Facebook, um, anyone who um, has gone on YouTube for about two minutes can actually identify where that photograph was taken, uh, creating pretty significant risks when people are out of town on vacation at the Grand Canyon, they know there's no one at your house, as well as some security issues with the photographing of young children and family members and things like that. 
So if you are using a smartphone, please be aware of the geotagging issue that um, automatically occurs. If you have a Canon uh, camera that has the ability to immediately upload photographs, it's automatically geotagged from all Can Canon devices. Just something to think about. Um, obviously, some of the other concerns from the, you know, from a police department standpoint, uh, there's been a lot of press and issues regarding people, police officers who post uh, some things that they probably should have thought about before they post pertaining to um, false testimony in court, pertaining to conduct that occurred while on duty and things like that. Um, all of this information can be traced back to uh, that individual officer as well as you if you are using a lot of uh, social media stuff. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit. This is one of our um, other initiatives. It's called Text-to-Tip. And if you're not aware of this, we have some stickers. But this year, uh, we wanted to come up with a way so that students, faculty, and staff could send anonymous information to the police department from their mobile devices. Uh, VCU tip is a way to do that. All you have to do is text VCU tip to 274637, and I receive those anonymous tips uh, on my BlackBerry. It now you, go ahead. It's very important. But text to tip is great where if you're walking to the parking deck and you see a light out and you, and you say, wow, that light, that would help if that light was on. Text that information to us. Uh, people say, well, how can it be anonymous? It's anonymous because the servers are stored outside of the United States. I have the ability to text back to whoever tips, but I have no way of finding out who that individual is. So it's 100% anonymous. It's been very, very popular with a lot of the student demographic. Um, and again, there's a lot of the information we get from the student demographic is stuff that I wish they'd like actually call the police department for because a lot of it requires some immediate action. We have gotten some drug tips and information that we've subsequ subsequently been able to make arrests on over uh, text to tip. So that's new for the police department. One of the other things that we do is uh, we post all of our daily crime on the website uh, on a daily basis. Uh, we just recently posted our annual security report. If you guys haven't seen that, please uh, look at that. Some of the other uses of social media uh, that other police departments are doing, we talked a little bit about social media stakeouts. Uh, with a lot of the uh, programs that are available like TacTweet and TweetDeck, you're actually able to go in and create like customized searches. Uh, my officers uh, on a regular basis go in and search things such as VCU marijuana, VCU drugs, VCU party. Um, and basically when you put in those search terms, it will give you whatever is being tweeted uh, throughout the United States pertaining to those, those categories. A lot of agencies are using uh, some of these search fe features for gang tracking. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, social media gang activity going on across the country, so much so that gangs are actually in some larger cities actually feuding on Facebook and Twitter. If you, could, if you think about that, it's kind of either you do it face to face or you do it kind of gang to gang. So a lot of police agencies are, are tracking that. And, well, yeah, yeah, it's, it's better until they meet up. Yeah, until they finally meet up. So, um, and the other thing, you know, Officer Rulin spoke a little bit about misinformation. And we are, um, you can follow the police department on Facebook and Twitter. And we are using these social media forums a lot more aggressively than we have in the past. So if we do have a situation that affects traffic on this campus, I will generally put that information, I will do a tweet on it so everyone's aware of it. Um, but we do tend to see a lot of misinformation um, in the social media world. Uh, the nice thing about some of the social media stuff is once you kind of get engaged, people come to defend you. 
So we will get kind of information, well, the VCU police department's all stupid. And then someone will say, yeah, well, they really helped me yesterday. So it's, it's not as part of these social media campaigns that you have to monitor the information all the time. I carefully monitor it just to see what's going on. But there is a lot of misinformation that circulates in the uh, social media network. Go ahead. We're going to talk real quick about identity theft. Um, obviously, the number one source of complaint uh, last year, over uh, eight and a half million victims, damages estimated at about $45 billion in the United States. Um, basically, every law enforcement organization I investigates identity theft nowadays. Um, generally, if you are the victim of identity theft, the first step is to uh, file a a police report where you live. Uh, FBI investigates some cases. Secret Service investigates, investigates some, some cases. Postal investigates cases. Um, FTC, that's their uh, website. If you have questions about identity theft, they are probably the foremost authority on all of it. They maintain a national database that all organizations use uh, pertaining to identity theft and things like that. So if you are the victim of identity theft, um, the FTC, FTC will have the database that will kind of link your case to some other cases that may potentially be related. If anyone has had the chance to do any reading about identity theft and the revenues that it, that it generates, there's also some dialogue that a lot of identity theft issues uh, basically take place from w outside of the United States have links to terrorism, have links to drug trafficking, as well as other criminal organizations. These are some of the things that you can do to uh, reduce your chance of being a victim. And actually, when I wrote these down, I'm like, violated that one, violated that one, violated that one. These are like common things that we all know, um, but we don't always do them. Personal information, obviously the recommendation is to shred and destroy all of your personal information, things that come in the mail. Um, looking at your bills on a regular basis is very, very helpful. Um, so hopefully if you are a victim of identity theft, you'll realize relatively early uh, versus when numerous accounts have been opened. And generally for identity theft victims, it's either utilization of your social security number um, it can be utilization of your driver's license information, well, where you'll receive something in the mail that you didn't go to court on a case where you were supposed to be there and you had no contact with the police. Um, and then obviously I think the most common one is obviously the use of your banking information and people having access to your information and opening up accounts um, in your name. Obviously computer virus protection is an important way to save your, safeguard yourself. And, um, you know, the avoidance on clicking on some of the hyperlinks that are attached to a lot of emails. And uh, if you're on the Internet a lot, I have uh, teenage kids who click on anything. Um, so, again, I can try and safeguard myself. But, again, that doesn't protect my computer device because, again, my kids click on, on everything. If you believe that you are a victim of identity theft, here's a couple of things that you can do. Uh, basically, all you need to do is call one of the major uh, credit uh, revisory companies um, and administer a fraud alert. Once you notify one, they notify the others. Um, that will prevent an account from being opened in your name without you being directly contacted. Um, Obviously, the next thing you need to do is contact uh, your creditors and let them know that you are a victim of identity theft. Um, generally, you will file a police report in the jurisdiction in which you live because it's very, very difficult to tell where, um, where you became a victim, where the information came from, where the information was used, and things like that. These are also very, very difficult cases for law enforcement to investigate because again, um, it's determining the, the origin of where your information was taken and where those accounts were, were opened. Generally, the banks and things like that are very, very cooperative with uh, clients. But again, a lot of these situations are really, really problematic. A lot of these situations can affect your credit, can affect um, 
the ability for you to get loans and things like that can affect your credit rating and things like that. So I've talked with a lot of people who have had nightmare situations uh, once their identity has been taken and compromised. Again, I think, event, I think the answer is yes, eventually, but it is a painstaking uh, process of restoring your credit, you know, um, and taking care of everything else. So, again, safeguards are important. My suggestion is, obviously, don't become a victim, uh, but the, the victims who go through, who have to go through this process, it is a, it is a nightmare. If you go to our website, I always say Google it. Google VCU Police will be the first thing that pops up. But if you wanted to type the whole thing in, it's vcu.edu backslash police backslash net crime. We have a whole page that talks about all this stuff, and there's videos on it. It's a, it's a great resource. And like I said, I may look into creating a separate link just for that. But um, there's something to think about. If you go to our web page, there's a link for crime prevention. <coughs> And then there's like, we were talking about this, is multiple links from there. So please take a look at that stuff. Again, I think if you look at the triangle, if, if, you, if people have access to your information, your personal information, uh, obviously Social Security numbers nowadays, now, you know, five years ago, your Social Security number was on everything. Now, if you put someone's Social Security number on something, it's like, that's the Social Security number, hide it real quick. So I think some of those safeguards, um, you know, are really, really important. But I think it's a lot of the common sense kind of things. Um, I know we all do banking, buying, shopping on our computers and things like that. And you just need to realize that one risk that, that comes with that is potentially your information could be taken. Your banking information could be taken. Um, that could result in your account being compromised. Worst case scenario, someone assuming your information, your um, date of birth, social security number, accounts being opened in your name. Um, if you have really good credit, you're a really good victim. If you have bad credit, uh, no one's going to want your identity if you got bad credit. <laughs> Seriously, so it's kind of all the things that, all the things that we kind of work to do to be really successful, um, you know, really maximize the potential of you becoming a victim. Um, I don't know who got the email in the VCU system the other day. I got the one, we need your password. Hey, chief, we need your password. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> as safe and secure as this network is here at VCU, and that stuff still gets, did anyone get that? Yeah. yeah. And IT gets the call, hey, is this legit? No, 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 it's not <laughs> legit. Um, and I guarantee you there were some people who probably, who probably clicked on that. So... Again, a lot of the, the things to safeguard ourselves, you know, in the crush of daily life and things like that, they kind of go by the wayside. And like I said, it's kind of, I'll get, hey, you just got a $10,000 loan. All you got to do is sign here. I don't shred it. I don't burn it. I don't stomp on it. I kind of tear it in half and throw it in the garbage. Because, um, again, we get caught up in, in the crush of life and things like that. But I would recommend on a yearly basis you need to get your credit report and kind of look at your credit report very, very closely. And uh, like I said, a lot of the things are just common sense type things uh, in protecting your critical information, social security number, date of birth, all your banking information and things like that, passwords. Um, I don't know who, who keeps their passwords in their password store in their BlackBerry. I've got a list of passwords in my BlackBerry, I'm telling you from the top of the ceiling to the floor. I have so many passwords, I don't even know, I, I couldn't even tell you half of them, and I have to look them up. But again, it's kind of, that's one of the ways that, you know, we need to kind of protect all of our information nowadays and change your passwords. You know, for those of us that have business devices and things like that, um, you know, you need to put the security in place so your device locks and things like that. And it's kind of, it's a pain if you haven't been on it for a little while or, um, but those are all things that, you know, you need to do to safeguard your information. This right here is my life. Every, everything I do is in my phone. Um, again, it's got the appropriate safety and security levels that, you know, you can't get my passwords and things like that. But nowadays, we keep all of our information uh, in our handheld devices. If you do some of the reading and you follow some of this stuff, there's lots of 
Um, you know, you get a strange uh, number on your cellular, cellular device. If you don't know who it is, um, don't answer it. Um, you know, you will receive a lot of um, SMS text type messages to your phone and things like that. If you don't know who it is, uh, delete, delete the message. There are tons and tons of uh, scams going around and none I could say that really target the VCU kind of population. But again, it's kind of we're all part of bigger communities and things like that and it seems like most of these scams we find out about it once it's kind of swept its way across the United States.